In just a little while, we'll be sounding the shofar. The question is always asked, why the shofar on Rosh Hashanah? Over the centuries, commentators have offered us a variety of reasons. Moses Maimonides famously called it a wake-up call to personal atonement. Others view it as a call to action or a tribute to God's power. This year, however, I believe one, year, one reason stands out among all others. Today, this Rosh Hashanah, we sound the shofar as a call to moral accountability. Today, we begin the holiest season of the year. Over the next 10 days, we'll be challenged to break open the shells of inertia and complacency that have built up over the past year. We'll sound the shofar to herald the inauguration of a deep, collective soul-searching, to look deep within, to face honestly what must be faced if we are to truly begin our new year anew. To put it frankly, I cannot honestly remember a Rosh Hashanah when the collective moral stakes were any higher than this year for the Jewish community. I would even go as far as to say this may be the most morally consequential high holiday season of our lifetimes. As we begin this new year, the shofar calls us to account for a genocide ongoing even as I speak, perpetrated by a nation acting in the name of the Jewish people. How can we begin to fathom the moral accounting of such a magnitude? Over 41,000 Palestinians killed in Gaza to date and over 95,000 injured, the majority of whom are women and children. According to one estimate, the ultimate death toll may eventually be nearly 200,000. Whole extended families, entire Palestinian bloodlines have been wiped out completely. Much of Gaza has been literally reduced to a human graveyard, with scores of bodies buried beneath the rubble of destroyed and bulldozed homes. Neighborhoods and regions are moonscapes They've literally been wiped off the map. Gaza's infrastructure and healthcare system has been decimated. According to the UN, and I quote, an intentional and targeted starvation campaign has now led to widespread famine and disease throughout the Gaza Strip. Polio has now broken out. Relief workers are literally working to deliver vaccines to children as bombs and missiles fall around them. Healthcare workers, humanitarian workers, journalists are being killed and injured and imprisoned in massive numbers. Human rights agencies have documented widespread torture and abuse of prisoners, including sexual abuse, throughout a network of torture camps. Please note that this unspeakable litany is not a review of the past year. It is a description of a nightmare that continues as I speak with no end in sight. As we contemplate this inhuman status quo, it occurs to me that this Rosh Hashanah, the broken sound of the shofar, is more than a mere call to accounting. It is a broken wail of grief and a desperate moral challenge. This year, the shofar calls out to us in no uncertain terms, we charge genocide. This is not a point upon which we can equivocate. Not today. On this day, we face what must be faced and say out loud what must be said. To argue this point now, would frankly be a sacrilege. From a purely legal point of view, 
A myriad of academic and legal experts have long since confirmed the charge of genocide. As far back as October, Holocaust and genocide scholar Roz Siegel called Israel's actions in Gaza, quote, a textbook case of genocide. On October 18th, almost 800 scholars, lawyers, and practitioners of human rights called on all relevant UN bodies, as well as the Office of the Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court to immediately intervene to protect the Palestinian population from genocide. More recently, Omer Bartov, a respected historian of the Holocaust and genocide studies at Brown Universities, accused Israel of, quote, systematic war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocidal actions. But beyond the legal arguments, there is a critical moral imperative behind this claim. For many Jews, it's impossible to imagine, let alone say out loud, that a Jewish state founded in the wake of the Holocaust could possibly be perpetrating a genocide. I understand the pain behind this refusal. I know it confronts many Jews with an unimag unimaginable prospect to accept that we have become our own worst nightmare. But if we cannot admit the truth of this on this of all days, then why bother ga gathering for Rosh Hashanah in the first place? To dither on this point would make a sham of the festival we dare to call the holiest season of the year. Not long ago, I had a long conversation with my dear friend and colleague, Rachel Beitari, the director of the Israeli organization Zohrot, which does Nakba education, awareness, and accountability work inside Israel. Rachel is among the precious few Israeli activists who are unabashedly in solidarity with Palestinians. You may remember her presentation to our tzedek community several months ago. Among other things, Rachel talked about what it was like to be an Israeli activist for Palestinian liberation who grew up on a kibbutz near the Gaza border, who personally knew Israelis who were killed and taken hostage on October 7th. During our more recent conversation, Rachel and I talked in particular about the way that is Israel metabolizes the traumatic memory of the Holocaust as a way to rationalize away its genocidal violence in Gaza. In a follow-up letter, email, to our conversation, Rachel wrote the following words to me that she gave me permission to share with you. As years go by and most Holocaust survivors are no longer with us, the identification and reliving of the trauma of former genocide seem only to grow in direct relation to the crimes committed under the excuse of the right to defend ourselves and to prevent a second Holocaust. Because of this unrelenting propaganda, the linkage of the Hamas attack of October 7th to the Holocaust was made immediately, even though it was logically bogus. It was understandable at first, especially from people, many of my friends and acquaintances among them, who personally experienced the horrors of that day, waiting for help that took many hours to come. Having grown up in Israel, as ex exposed as we are to re-traumatizing Holocaust education, the associative connection was almost inevitable. Soon, however, it became clear that this linkage was being overblown and manipulated to justify the annihilation of Gaza, to justify, dare I say it, another Holocaust." End quote. Many outside of Israel have made the linkage between October 7th and the Holocaust as well. Almost immediately, in fact, the terrible massacres of that day were openly characterized as, quote, the worst mass murder of Jews since the Holocaust. 
As Rachel pointed out, however, the two events have nothing to do with each other whatsoever. And the comparison lacks, uh, distinctly lacks a power analysis. Still, it is indeed painfully poignant to consider that this mass killing occurred in a state founded in the wake of the Holocaust in order to safeguard Jewish lives once and for all. We can only imagine what on earth will be said about October 7th on its one-year anniversary, which will arrive exactly between today and Yom Kippur. From what I've read about officially sponsored Jewish community commemorations, the dominant message will be thoroughly suffused with a Holocaust-informed victim mentality. Bring them home. We stand with Israel. It's us against the world. With nary a mention of the vengeful carnage Israel has been unleashing on Gaza for the better part of a year. In contrast to this particular messaging, however, I would suggest that sacred Jewish tradition presents us with an important opportunity on this anniversary. Yes, the days of awe are an occasion to mourn the losses of the past year, but this season is also a time to seek out a deeper understanding, to do a genuine accounting and take real accountability. As we start to reckon with the events of October 7th, I would suggest that the first step would be to admit that this date was not a starting point. If we are to truly and honestly commemorate this anniversary, we must understand it in the context of the ongoing violence and injustice known as the Nakba, a nightmare that began decades ago and is still ongoing. As Israel's violence in Gaza escalated during the final months of 2023, Tzedek Chicago's board had numerous conversations about whether or not to issue a congregational statement. I'll make a confession. I wasn't originally in favor of it. To be honest, I was starting to become dubious about the value of these kinds of gestures. At a moment when so many of us were working overtime, organizing on behalf of this Palestine solidarity movement, it seemed like a waste of time to spend our time on a congregational statement. It felt like the only statement that needed to be made over and over again in the streets was ceasefire now. Eventually, however, I came to agree with our board that said at Chicago, as an avowedly anti-Zionist congregation, had a unique congregational voice to offer on this issue. And so, during the month of December, we worked together to craft a statement titled, In Gaza, Israel is Revealing the True Face of Zionism. I'll quote to you from it. We know there was a crucial underlying context to the horrible violence of October 7th. We assert without reservation that to contextualize is not to condone. On the contrary, we must contextualize these events if we are to truly understand them and find a better way forward. The violence of October 7th did not occur in a vacuum. It was a brutal response to a regime of structural violence that has oppressed Palestinians for decades. At root of this oppression is Zionism, a colonial movement that seeks to establish and maintain a Jewish majority nation state in historic Palestine. While Israel was founded in the traumatic wake of the Holocaust to create safety and security for the Jewish people, it was a state founded on the backs of another people, ultimately endangering the safety and security of Jews and Palestinians alike. Israel was established through what Palestinians refer to as the Nakba, the ethnic cleansing of 750,000 Palestinians from their homes in 1948. And since that time, Israel has subjected Palestinians to a regime of Jewish supremacy in order to maintain its demographic majority in the land. This ongoing Nakba is the essential context for understanding the horrifying violence of the past three months. Indeed, since October 7th, 
Israeli politicians have been terrifyingly open about their intentions, making it clear that the ultimate end goal of their military assault is to ethnically cleanse Gaza of its 2.2 million Palestinian residents. One prominent member of the Israeli government put it quite plainly, quote, we are now rolling out the Gaza Nakba, Gaza Nakba 2023, that's how it'll end. More recently, this was recently in December, Prime Minister Netanyahu was reported as saying that he is actively working to transfer Palestinians out of Gaza. The problem, he said, is which countries will take them. Israeli leaders are being true to their word. We are witnessing the continuation of the Nakba in real time. As in 1948, Palestinians are being driven from their homes through force of arms. As in 1948, families are being forced to march long distances with hastily collected possessions on their backs. As in 1948, entire regions are being razed to the ground, ensuring that they will have no homes to return to. As in 1948, Israel is actively engineering the wholesale transfer of an entire population of people. It is now eight months since we released that statement, and I believe it is more accurate than ever. In her letter to me, Rachel observed the irony that more and more Israelis are now threatening a second Nakba when, quote, until recently, Israelis denied that a Nakba even happened. Now, however, many Israelis are using the term with unabashed vengeance. Through word and deed, Israel's ultimate end game is becoming all too clear. It is the ethnic cleansing of Gaza. This past August, in fact, the Israeli press, in the paper Haaretz, revealed the presence of a government plan for Israel's long-term occupation of Gaza on the day after. According to the plan, and I'm quoting the article, Israel will control the northern Gaza Strip and drive out the 300,000 Palestinians still there. Major General Giorda Iland, the war's ideologue, proposes starving them to death or exiling them as a lever with which to defeat Hamas. The Israeli right envisions a Jewish settlement of the area with vast real estate potential of convenient topography, a sea view, and proximity to central Israel. The southern Gaza Strip will be left for Hamas, which will have to care for the destitute residents under Israeli siege, even after the international community loses interest in the story and moves on to other crises." End quote. In other words, a real-time Nakba is being discussed openly in Israeli political and academic circles. More recently, on September 15th, Professor Uri Rabi, a prominent researcher at Tel Aviv University, actually said these words in a radio interview. Quote, remove the entire civilian population from the north, and whoever remains there will be lawfully sentenced as a terrorist and subjected to a process of starvation or extermination. As we engage in moral accounting over the next 10 days, we must reckon seriously with words such as these. Indeed, from the beginning of this genocide, Israeli leaders and politicians have been all too transparent about their intentions, just as the founders of the Zionist movement themselves, from Theodore Herzl to David Ben-Gurion, promoted the, quote, transfer of the native Palestinian population to make way for a majority Jewish state. Then, as now, we must take these leaders at their word. We must take them very seriously. We can never say we didn't know. More than ever, this high holiday season calls us to reckon seriously with what Zionism has wrought, not only in Gaza, but throughout the West Bank, where horrifying violence and ethnic cleansing is running rampant, and now in Lebanon, which is experiencing its own mass carnage and displacement, 
bringing the entire region ever closer to all-out war. How could it be otherwise? This is what comes of an ideology and a movement that from the beginning viewed Jewish safety as zero-sum, in which our security can only be achieved at the expense of others, empowerment gained through the sheer power of superior military technology, stronger weapons, and higher walls. And finally, this high holiday season, we must take this opportunity to ask ourselves collectively, where have we fallen short? This is a critical question in particular for those of us who have been active in the Palestine Solidarity Movement. If this is indeed the season for hard truths, we must face the fact that despite all our efforts this past year, we failed, we failed to stop a genocide. For all our calls for ceasefire on street corners and in the halls of city governments, for all the mass protests and acts of civil disobedience, for all of the courageous student activism on university campuses, a ceasefire seems farther away than ever at the moment. This is not to say there hasn't been genuine progress this past year, but how do we measure these successes against the mass killing that has occurred and continues to occur every single day? On this point, I'd like to share with you the words of Sumaya Awad of the Adallah Justice Project, who offered this powerful challenge at the plenary for the Socialism 2024 conference here in Chicago last month. And I'm quoting Sumaya now. We know that there has been a massive shift in the United States around Palestine. We have seen poll after poll show that the majority of Americans support an arms embargo. The majority of Americans don't want to support Israel, are critical of Israel, and yet we haven't seen that translate into the mass action we need. Despite this massive shift, we must grapple with the fact that this shift came at the expense of how many lives lost, how many people murdered, who, prayed the, who paid the price for these people to shift. And it's not to say that this shift is not tremendous and incredible and good. It is all of those things. But we must also grapple with the fact that lives are being lost on the daily and that it is all by design and that it can all be stopped in basically a moment. And I say this not to pity Palestinians, quite the opposite, nor that we must grieve more. Grief is necessary, but that's not the answer. I say it all because we have to keep asking ourselves, you have to keep asking yourselves, what am I doing with this knowledge? What am I doing with this education? How is it translating into action? How does it translate into action that does not preach to the choir, but preaches to those who are not yet where we need them to be? And you have to have an answer to that question, because a year from now, when you are back here, you have to have an answer. Don't find yourself just asking the same question. Be ready to answer, what have I done in the past year? When Sumaya said those words, and I heard her say those words, it went straight to my heart knowing that the high holidays were coming up. When she asked that question, we need to ask ourselves next year, what have I done to make a change? Though she spoke these words in a very different context, I find them nonetheless appropriate to the sacred imperative of this new year. A year from now, when we are back here, we will have to have an answer. We can't find ourselves just asking the same question. We must be ready to answer, what did we do last year to bring this genocide to an end? I know this in my heart and soul as well. Years from now, we will likewise have to stand in judgment. When the story of this genocide is written, we will be asked, did we speak out? And if so, what did we say? And what did we risk? For now, that book is still open, even if every new page is becoming increasingly unbearable to read. 
even if the world would rather move on to another story? How will we write ourselves into this book when it is finally recorded? May we all play our part in bringing this book of genocide to a finish. May it come to an end soon in our own day. And when it does, may we come to understand it was only part of a larger story, an even greater book that will, will conclude with these glorious words. Then Palestine was finally free from the river to the sea. <laughs>